Our mission is to promote and support interdisciplinary teaching, research, and meaningful public engagement to advance the production and dissemination of knowledge about Latin America and Iberia. Latin America is designated as one of seven priority areas of research for UNM, and we proudly contribute to both the university's intellectual community as well as global discourse through programming. I'd like to first acknowledge that the University of New Mexico sits on the traditional homelands of the Pueblo of Sandia, the original peoples of New Mexico, Pueblo, Navajo, and Apache, since time immemorial, have deep connections to the land and have made significant contributions to the broader community statewide. We honor the land itself and those who remain stewards of this land throughout the generations and also acknowledge our committed relationship to indigenous peoples. We gratefully recognize our history. It's a pleasure to introduce Professor Rosa Vallejos, Associate Professor of Linguistics at the University of New Mexico, whose talk today is entitled, The Hummingbird is Attached to the Flower, Conceptualizations of Space in the Amazon. Professor Vallejos' research is centered in Amazonia, where she pursues research in three areas of linguistics, morphosyntax, language contact, and documentary fieldwork. Since 1997, she's been involved in several community-oriented projects with indigenous groups. Her fieldwork has generated a rich stream of documentation on Kukama, Kukamiria, Sequoia, and Amazonian Spanish. Her, res her research informs current debates concerning the range of variation possible in languages, which ultimately shows the development of cross-linguistically valid theories of human language. At the same time, her work provides crucial language resources for the speech communities she works with. So please join me in welcoming Professor Vallejos. Thank you so much, Francis, and thank you everyone for being here today. And uh, I have prepared some slides that I will share now. Today, we'll, I will share some of my work with two groups in the Amazon, as uh, Frances mentioned already, and um, also highlight some collaboration with uh, both community members uh, of these uh, speech communities, but also with uh, some students here at UNM. So I've been lucky to be able to have the chance to work with this, uh, all these wonderful people. And if you see here in the uh, screen, uh, there's a card. Actually, this was a card that um, we used to work with, with kids in the creation of stories in, in the Amazon, but also was the, um, uh, used in a, the first reading book that we created for uh, the sequoias. And here's uh, one picture. When uh, we did this in a workshop, the first book was created in a workshop in 2005 with teachers. And this is a, a language that doesn't have yet a long tradition of literacy. Uh, I've uh, helped them collaborate with them in the design of the first writing system that is in place. Since 2005, 2006, we uh, continue to implement this um, effort. And uh, uh, so in 2005, we did a workshop with teachers uh, to create the, uh, the first reading book. It's a short, small reading book. I think it only has like 22 or so, or around that number of texts, short texts for, for small kids. And in 2006, I had a chance to visit the communities and uh, bring the books, the printed books for the first time. And they were all illustrated by, by speakers of the community themselves, by teachers themselves. And some people that didn't know how to read or write, they draw and told our stories orally. We recorded those and transcribed them, you know, created summaries and things like that. And so we, uh, when the professor was uh, presenting the book, and you can see in the cover, there's this picture of the hummingbird in a flower. And this is a part of the, the series, the first series of uh, children book. Each series has a name of a bird because birds are really very attractive for kids and for everybody, right? But particularly for kids. So the first one is Mimi, which is uh, the uh, hummingbird. And then we have uh, others. Um, I don't even know how the English version is, Martin Pescador and Picaflor and all of that. But well, we were birds uh, as we progress in, in elementary school. And so in this context, the teacher asked, right? Where, uh, the, the, she was describing, where's the hummingbird? And uh, one of the kids said, it's attached to the flower. 
And for me, that was at the moment it didn't kind of click too much, but it still attracted the type of answer that it could, it could give, right? Perhaps I was expecting more like, oh, the hummingbird is uh, on the flower, is in the flower, something like that, but it's attached to the flower. That, that was the attention. And uh, this uh, first reading book was such a success, and the kids really enjoyed it. And uh, if, not only for kids, but also for adults. So you can see here this. Uh, uh, this is another friend of mine, another consultant. He was extremely, uh, you know, motivated. I don't know if motivated the word. Excited to see. Um, I imagine see themselves because of. Um, they all contributed to this, this this small project, right? And we, after that, we continue to do more uh, books like this for kids and other types of resources as well. So this is kind of the, the explanations for the title. Why is this, uh, I chose this title. And um, so today I'm gonna present very uh, basic ideas uh, to understand the topic uh, uh, at hand. So when we talk about space, the location of a, a figures in, in, in space is what I want to be the, the focus today. And uh, specifically static location, meaning uh, lo uh, locating figures that we conceive, we perceive as not moving, as being static in one place, right? And for that, we are talking about the location of objects that will be called, uh, generally called figures, and uh, in relation to a space that will be referred here as ground. Right? And so uh, languages can differ in the types of uh, conceptualizations about static location. And we know that because we see that languages can have different types of expressions, right? And so to answer a question like, uh, where is X? X being the figure, being a figure. The studies, uh, cross-linguistic studies, typological studies that look at uh, different languages and compare languages have come up with at least three types. The first type would be uh, languages that use a general copy, the general uh, verb-like elements that would establish the relationship between figures and grounds. Right? And you all should be familiar with this system because English is one uh, of this type of system, right? Here you said the bottle is on the table, the bottle is in the basket, regardless of what type of figure we are located or regardless of the type of ground where the figure is being located. In both cases, you uh, will use the same type of element that link these two, the figure and the ground, would be a single copy, right? And something similar happens in Spanish, for example, right? Here we have la botella está en la mesa, la pelota está en la mesa. Again, it doesn't matter what type of figure we are locating, uh, or even the ground. There is a, a little difference between English and uh, Spanish, as you can tell, and every second language speaker of English now is that in English, we pay attention to some extent to the ground. And this is um, manifested here in the use of different type of prepositions, okay? In Spanish, we do not, but in English, we do pay attention to it. We're supposed to pay attention to it. So those are, this is one type of language in which you have a single element that makes the link, the connection between the figure and the ground, okay? establish that relationship. But there are also languages that you pay attention, more close attention to the figure themselves that it's being located, to the ground where the figure is located, and to the relationship between the figure and the ground. Okay? So, so in addition to this type one languages, um, we have these other two types of languages, okay? That's how being the languages identified. Type two languages would be some that have, for instance, a small set of verbs to express location, a small being between two and 10 around that range. But there are also languages that have a huge number of verbs dedicated to express location. And uh, this is, uh, these types of systems have been found particularly in Mesoamerica, for example, okay? And uh, so to, in order to study, since there are so many ways in which the languages can express location, okay, speakers can talk about location, there have been some attempts to design um, resources for field workers to go and collect this information and study this information in systematic ways to be able to compare 
responses from different speakers. And once we make some types of general decisions about a single language, then we can make comparisons across languages, right? So that we do not end up comparing apples with oranges. So that's the idea of using, for instance, some types of stimuli of um, uh, some resources so that we can uh, collect information. And these um, uh, efforts have been led by these guys, for instance, Ameka uh, and Levinson in, in Europe. They have designed quite a bit of uh, some stimuli for that. So this is um, some of the instruments that I've used in my own fieldwork uh, with both communities, with the Kokamas and the Sequoias. And in particular, this set here is, for instance, a collection of 76 video clips that look at a location, but more in dynamic ways. We have the figure, we have the ground, and we have the figure moving through a path to the dimension, right? That's what this is a selection of, a collection of videos are for. And here we have a, a a collection of uh, pictures uh, designed specifically to explore the question of the static location that will be more of the, more of the focus of today. But I will I'll talk about this with this particular type of stimuli in more detail today. And then there's uh, I've used also uh, sets of cards to uh, elicit either static location and then the creation of stories, you know, in connected, more connected speech, more natural speech. And uh, I've used all the resources like here, this one, Amazonia, to be able to identify different types of, for instance, uh, flora and fauna species, which is difficult for somebody that doesn't have a degree in biology or zoology, I think like that. It's, it, we have to have some resources. Then I mentioned this because one of the questions that I usually get in presentations that are not necessarily only um, oriented to linguists is how do you work with a community that where perhaps you don't understand, you know, you're not fluent in the language, or they are not fluent in the language that the field workers speak? How do you start? What, how do you do? So we, in linguistics, we have um, uh, training on field work methodologies. And one of the ways, there are several strategies to work uh, uh, to start from basically scratch right when you uh, from the beginning how do you collect the first words and how do you know that they are saying hand and not eyes and not hair this kind of thing. okay so i'm just mentioning here that i am using uh, uh, several resources in these communities so now i'm gonna uh, introduce briefly the uh, first um, speech community that i work with and these are the Kokama Kokamirias. And uh, um, here uh, in this picture, I uh, have a few young uh, Kokama uh, that are learning the language, uh, the Kokama language, as a heritage language because um, they have, the communities have shifted to Spanish about five or six decades ago by now. The dominant language in the region, in the Kukama region, is Spanish already. But there are multiple efforts right now to learn Kukama as a heritage language. I see this picture represents this movement of these young uh, community members. So the Kukamas live in this region here in Loreto, in Peru. And this map represents the linguistic diversity in the, in the country. Uh, in total, there are officially recognized 48 indigenous languages in Peru, in addition to a Peruvian sign language and a multiple varieties of Spanish. And um, the more colorful part, each color here represents a linguistic family. And so the more colorful part is in the Amazon. These brown uh, portions, uh, they represent a Quechua, which is the dominant language in the Andes, right? And so the Kokamas live in this region here. Okay? The total population is estimated, we don't have uh, numbers, exact numbers. It's estimated at around 20,000. And the speakers of the language are no more than uh, 1,500 at this point. And the majority are elders. And uh, there was a census in 2017. And according to this census, um, Almost uh, 1,200 declared having learned uh, to speak in Kokama, but uh, no more. Okay, so I work with them over the years since uh, actually since '97, but more serious 
field work since 2006, right? And in, in uh, different kinds of projects, uh, but I'm quite familiar with uh, this uh, region. And we use the term Kukama and Kokamiria because to make sure to make reference to the language as a whole. In this part here uh, is the Kukamiria dialect, what is spoken in this region here, it's the Guayaga River. And in all this region here is the Kukama dialect. There's they are pretty close dialects, but they recognize themselves as two different groups, right? And uh, uh, the, the, there's not a, a problems of communication between the, the speakers of both dialects. Uh, so the Kokama Kukamira refers to both dialects. That's what we use this, this expression. So here I'm going to present some examples of how is location, static location, expressed in this language. And I'm going to use one drawing and, uh, that I've created on the spot when I was in the middle of the field work. I said, oh, I need to uh, understand this a little bit better. Let's see if uh, maybe I, I need to mention a couple of things here. <laughs> this is supposed to represent house, right? I'm not good at drawing, as you can tell. This is a tree. And here is a hawk. Lion and looking for chicken in the, in, the, in the house, around the house, and this is a snake. Here's a hammock, there's a basket, and of course, this is the floor of the house, which is usually at the distance because of the communities are usually flooded by water. And the other piece that you may want to know here that this is a canoe. This is supposed to be a dog. I know that somebody sees a horse here, but this is supposed to be a, a, a dog, and then there's a kid behind. So in uh, Kokama, if you want to say, where is X? Let's say I want to locate the hammock or the um, basket. So it's very simple. You just say the most common way of saying this would be the hammock is in the house. And what you have here is hammer, house, and just this post position that indicates in. You don't need any verb. There's no copula, there's no verb. So this would be a construction that it's like zero copula. We don't need any connector. Those are the two things that are needed. And you see the same pattern for basket, right? And there's nothing else. This is a very common uh, uh, way of uh, expressing location and in which you just juxtapo juxtapose the figure and the ground and some specification via a, a postposition. And, uh, but there, of course, the language also has many other ways, many not, but a few other ways of specifying location if they want to pay attention to some details. Okay, here's one. Here, what you have are more specialized um, verb, uh, words that indicate location, but these are not necessarily postpositions in the same way as ca is. Okay? This ca would represent in Spanish, in English, uh, three postpositions, major postpositions, in, on, at, at the same time. The, the meaning is collapsed into this form. Here you have more specific ways, right? The chicken is below the floor here. The hawk is above the house. Here you have the snake is above the house and you use the same expression. Regardless of the fact, regardless if the figure is actually touching the surface, in this case, the house, right, the ground, or is above with a distance between, this two, between the reference point, okay? And then you have, um, what else here? Uh, the kid is behind the tree. You have here the kid, the kid is behind the tree. Okay, so this is another way of a, a specified location with more, a, with more details. There, here's another way of doing it. And here what my use it is, uh, this words in blue is what we would call relational now. Those are the nouns that will establish the relationship between the figure and the ground. Here you have the dog is by the side of the tree or the, the canoe is uh, by the edge of the river. And here the dog is by the trunk of the tree. You use here a portion of the tree as a reference point, okay? And here's another way of uh, talking about location. Here, what is uh, really cool is that they are describing how is the, the hammock 
the manner in which the, the, the hammock is uh, attached or the relationship between the figure and the girl. In this case, the hammock is tied inside the house, okay? The, the blue portion indicates the, the, the disposition of the figure in relation to the, to the knot. And the same thing here, you have the basket is sitting above the floor. You see this, they are using uh, this, this expression that are more, um, um, we will call this one as we go further in the talk, more like a posture bed, okay? And this would be more like a manner bed. Okay, so these are the, the elements that, uh, the ways of expressing location in, uh, in the Amazon, uh, in this language in particular, again, depending on what type of uh, details they wanna uh, portray, they wanna pay attention to, they wanna highlight. And as I said again, the first most common response uh, that some people would call that like the default or the preferred would be the first one without any other component, very basic figure ground and uh, post position done, okay? So that's how it is done mostly in, in Coca. Okay, now I'm gonna switch now to Sequoia to see how they do this. Uh, so let's start with uh, the Sequoias. Where are they located? Here they are. They live in this region here in the borders of Colombia and uh, Peru and Ecuador, Ecuador, uh, Peru, Colombia, in that uh, portion. And the population in total uh, is um, no more than a thousand, as you can tell here, but a thousand estimates again. And uh, in Peru, they, uh, there are at least 700, around 700. And in Ecuador, there's a, a smaller portion, which is uh, the result of uh, recent migrations around the 1940s because of some conflicts in the region. And um, according to the last census, uh, uh, there are only 638 in Peru declared to have learned to speak in Sequoia. So this is a small population. In Peru, they live only in seven villages. And here are the uh, villages where they located. And I've also conducted fieldwork with uh, them for a while now. And the first time in 2005, as I said, the first uh, 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 meetings that we had were more for the production of uh, resources for elementary schools than for linguistic research per se. And only lately I've been, I start studying more uh, the language itself. Okay, so I visited this community all these years for different uh, times, uh, time periods. Okay, so what uh, the first thing that we uh, notice in Sequoia is that they have several ways to express location and they use several types of verbs to express static location. That was something that it's clearly noticeable. So the preliminary observations pointed in that direction. So in order to do a more detailed study, what I did was I used this stimuli here which are, is a collection of, as I said, 68 uh, verbs, these uh, pictures, uh, in which the, the researchers who designed the stimuli wanted to control for what types of figures will be located, what types of grounds will be uh, included in the study. So they control for the variable figure, for the variable ground, also for the number of items being located. So for instance, you have pictures with three cassava, but there are other pictures with one cassava, right? You have pictures with one ball, but there are pictures with multiple balls, like two or three balls, soccer balls. And then you have pictures like it was a ball in a table or a ball on the floor, things like that. So, so to be able to control for different variables so that we can have uh, different possibilities, different scenarios to, to elicit uh, responses from speakers, right? So to these 68 pictures, what I did was I added some others. Most of these would be um, uh, what we would consider uh, stimulated that are um, culturally appropriate in the sense that they're not necessarily offensive, that most of the items will be uh, recognized, most of, most of the items, keep that in mind. And the, the situations could be kind of um, not necessarily completely new. And so those are, that's important. 
But also we wanna make sure that the, the responses that we get are actually used in a, a usual situations in the community. So um, um, I added 20 other pictures and to the to the set which is recommended we want to add some other uh, you know scenes that are uh, usually uh, what the, the speakers see every day right and so here of course now maybe i need to explain this is a, a, a crown that it's used by elders usually men but mostly uh, men in general but mostly elders and it's usually placed and say preserved save in a, uh, this type of stick in the house within the house this is something that everybody is familiar with these are uh, some pots being dry, come to dry in a tree. And this is, uh, oh shoot, now how do I explain this? Uh, this is to green uh, either grain or also some more um, cassava, for instance. And uh, of course, these are clothes being dried. This is cassava bread being dried, uh, dried out at the end of the sun. And then cassava bread being uh, made. And here I am with one of the, um, um, you know, um, the subjects eliciting the responses looking at these pictures. And so what I did was I collected this in 2018. I uh, ran this, uh, all these pictures, 88 in total, uh, with these six speakers, right? We have six uh, language consultants that uh, gave us responses for this um, um, particular stimulus. Now I'm gonna uh, show you a couple of uh, responses um, from that I've obtained so that we can talk. And also you can hear uh, how Sequoia sounds like, okay? So this is picture seven in which you see a, a ball is on the ground and this is the response that was given. Okay. So the, uh, I um, highlighted in red the piece that is uh, most interesting here. Uh, I mean, the topic of this talk is that they are using the verb uico, which is lying, which is used to talk about human beings lying somewhere, right? In the first place. And then it's extended to talk about inanimate entities, to locate inanimate entities in space as well, right? Here. What she's saying is the ball is on the ground, right? By using this verb line. And uh, here we have, okay, this is enough. And here you have a different type of uh, picture. As you can see uh, here, there's a, a border, right? And I'm wondering how would you describe this? How would you? Probably you would say, the bottle is on the floor, maybe. I don't know. If you want to interact and give responses in the chat, go ahead and do that. And uh, so here are the responses that I've collected. One is the bottle is standing on the ground, using the verb standing, is in the ground, and the bottle is sitting on the ground. And you may uh, uh, wonder why two possible responses. In this case, we have, I believe, four responses with uh, standing and two with sitting, or, or three and three, I don't remember exactly. And here's how it sounds, the first one. Okay. And so uh, with, with Minkako here. What happens here is that a piece of the bottle, some portion of the bottle, the base, is inserted in the ground. And that if it's not inserted, just put on, everybody would probably would have said Minkako. But because it's a little uh, portion is inserted, is, uh, was uh, construed as both, was used as, as Minkako and Nyoiko, right? So that was a, a really interesting pattern that, that emerged. But it, within the uh, 88 picture, there were some that we could think as all. And uh, because of the reactions that uh, elicited in the, in, the, in the speakers. And uh, I don't know if you, uh, this uh, look, um, what would you say? Okay, what would be your, your take of this? This is one of those pictures. Oops, the one that is. 
Right. So uh, I don't know if you uh, can see the what's going on here. This is a, a ceramic a pot clay made up of clay that is placed on a big tree, right? And at first it was uh, kind of uh, uh, very strange for them to say, why would somebody put a ceramic uh, uh, a pot of this kind here in the tree, high up there? And uh, as, uh, how they explain is, I mean, this is, takes so much uh, time to complete one of these pieces. It's uh, too much work to put it in a, in a uh, kind of play with it like this in this way and put it in, in, a, in a tree and leave it there. Right? So that was kind of uh, an interesting report. Everybody said, oh, wh what's going on here? And uh, one of the uh, responses of, of ways that um, they describe, it's usually emphasizing the fact that somebody may have placed this in purpose, okay, in this specific way. So it goes beyond just the pot is on a branch of the tree, it's on the tree. It is more about that somebody put it in a specific disposition, the figure in a specific way so that it can remain stuck, stuck there. They use that, some of those expressions. So here's, um, and it's not uh, that it's strange in the community to have, to see pots hanging in trees. As I, I showed you before, this is one of the pictures that I use as well. So here you see all these aluminum pots and plastic, you know, uh, baskets or things like that are hanged to dry in a tree. So that's not, uh, it's not strange, the position itself, but it's uh, the fact that uh, this particular type of pot made of clay, that it's so fragile that it can be broken, all of that that made it so the, the reactions were interesting. And so this more like, uh, let's say more marked uh, situation, more complex, uh, pragmatically odd uh, situations, they, uh, the expressions that we got, the, the responses were most um, uh, like this, something like this. A pot is neatly located upside down on a small branch of the tree. The, uh, you know, uh, elaborating in every possible detail about the location, but it was not just a simple response of locating a pot is in the tree. It's more, more about there's something else here that we may want to pay attention and we highlight. That was something that uh, was said. And something for, for this one would be specifying the, what this, the material of what these um, elements are made of made out, uh, the aluminum, everybody specified, the aluminum pots and the plastic containers are hooked to dry on the branches of the tree. You know? And the other thing that was, uh, I'm gonna give you both, are uh, that were found a little bit strange is this one. I don't know if you can identify what this is. This is a rock and a rope. So the one item that is being located is the rope on a relationship to the rock. What happened here is nobody could identify that this is a rock. And it has to do with the fact that in the Amazon and particularly in this region, this is lowland Amazonia, there are no rocks. They are not familiar with rocks. In fact, they, some of them, they buy rocks. And one of the, my first trips to the region was, uh, was uh, uh, getting in contact with my um, with one uh, friend. And I was saying, okay, do you need something for me? Do you want me to take something? Because they usually ask you for some medicine, for instance. And they say, I want a rock. And for me it was, uh, why would you need a rock? And uh, because they wanted to, to sharpen their, their, they use this to sharpen their, the machete, for instance. Anyway, so. This is the other one and a picture that had like a similar uh, type of uh, surprise and couldn't identify what this is. I don't know if you can. In this particular case, what we have are beans and uh, the, the beans are spread on the ground, right? And uh, so for the first one, uh, Again, they pay attention to not only the rope and the, and the rope, but what is it about the, the relationship between them? So there were very sophisticated, detailed descriptions of what they were saying. Rope is under, on top, across a wall. It was a bit, several types of verbs together to be able to capture what's going on here. And um, in this case here down, we have that the beans are spread on the floor and they would add something like playing with it, 
something like that. But first I have to explain that these are beings because of this type of being that uh, they don't know, they're not familiar with this type of being that doesn't exist, this particular type of being in the deity. So you have to explain what this is first. Anyways, so those was the, this set of uh, pictures were part of the um, stimuli that was designed in the lab, right? And there were also some pictures that I have to exclude for reasons. And I wanna uh, also uh, show, share this with you so that you can uh, think about what kinds of ideas they may have or what they are they pay attention actually when they see something, for instance, here. What I have, what I was looking for with this picture, this is in the community actually, this is in the river in, uh, close to the community in the Putumayo River. And um, I was looking for something like the plane is in the river, the plane is uh, on the water, but nobody say anything like that, nobody. I, uh, nobody mentioned the ground, no matter water in this case. So what, what do you think could have been happening? Everybody says something like this. The plane is coming or the plane is leaving. And then I ask, why? Why, why do you think uh, that it's coming or leaving? And they say, ah, oh, come on, look at the water. Don't you see? There's some, there seem to be some movement. There seem to be some even small waves, but there are some waves. So this has to be that the plane is either, either arriving or leaving. But nobody saw this as a static situation, static scene which is very interesting, uh, was interesting to me. Like I, I didn't notice that detail, but for them were extremely salient that nobody said that. Here's another one. And here I was hoping for something like the cassava bread is on the grill, it's on the fire, something like that. You see, here's the cassava bread. Somebody's making cassava bread, right? It's on the fire. Nobody said, the cassava bread is on the grill and the fire, nothing. Everybody said a woman is making cassava bread. I have some hypothesis about this, but I'm not sure what's go uh, exactly because this is something that uh, we haven't discussed much. So if you have some ideas, I would like to hear what's going on. One uh, hypothesis that I have here is that uh, what is uh, more salient is the overall situation of uh, cassava making. That's one way. It's that's what it's interesting and important about this picture. Or the other one is that the more salient uh, piece here is the human being because of its um, human, <laughs> its animate, uh, regardless of you know instead of the castle bread. So even if it's just one portion of the human body here, this is what it's more uh, salient in this in this picture. Okay. So, but that's uh, an area that I will continue to work with in the, in the future. And the last set of uh, pictures that were excluded are, uh, I'm showing it here. What I was hoping, this is cassava bread. Once they finish uh, grilling the cassava bread, they put it to dry in a specific types of uh, ropes uh, at the side of the house, right? Um, this is important for preservation. So if they have to do this so that they, these breads can be preserved for longer periods of time, right? And this is a, a type of tortilla, but if, if made of, out of cassava. So I was expecting something like the cassava bread is in the rope or something like that, right? Nobody said that. Everybody, a six speaker said, the cassava bread is hanging to dry, okay? And I did ask the speaker why it, it would be okay to put it in the rope. And, and one told me, but why would you want to do that? Everybody knows that uh, it's uh, drying on the rope and because we have a dedicated, designated rope, right? Where to dry the cassava bread. It's not like it dries anywhere. And so if, if uh, to, you ask, where's the cassava bread? Imagine I'm one, one piece, I, I need to eat something because you eat with the cassava bread every, every type of food all your food. And uh, you say, oh, it's, it's hanging to dry, saying that everybody would know where exactly is and would go and get one. So because of uh, the, the type of knowledge you have, uh, it's important. But I, I so this is a, a way of answering a question, where is X, where is the cassava bread? About it done indirect way, you make an inference as to where is the cassava bread, but not necessarily because the, the location, the place is mentioned, explicitly mentioned here, right? 
And I, I is, is found afterwards of thinking about that. We do this all the time uh, in, you know, um, we, in speaking English or Spanish as well, right? Make inferences. And now I also had this other picture in the stimuli. Here you have, uh, those are clothes being, uh, you know, hung to, to dry. Could you, uh, now what would be your guess? Do they say rope or not? This picture was included, was ultimately included because everybody did mention the rope. So now the question is what's going on here? And here the clothes are hanging to dry in the rope. One of the explanations that I have at this point is that because here in this particular scene, rope is informative. It matters here. It is informative because you could hang those uh, clothes in other places as well. Like for instance, you could, and they do hang it uh, on this um, sticks. You could put them there. Or when the uh, women are uh, drying, they, they're doing the laundry in the river usually, they, could, they throw it in the bushes, the, dry, the clothes to, to dry out. Um, so that they're not that heavy when they go up to the, the, the houses of the community, right? They have to walk from the river. And so they, it's normal to put it to dry. So I, I, my idea is here that it's, it's informative because there are multiple uh, ways in which there are other possible uh, grounds for the clothes to be hanging uh, on, okay? As opposed to this one, which is not, that is, this is the designated place. So those are the hypotheses that I have, but I would like to hear your thoughts if you have some ideas. So um, we did uh, then, uh, I did collect this data with all these pictures, 88 in total, and we ended up with um, uh, 470 uh, clauses that have actually the figure, they have the ground and some verbs and uh, um, to talk about the location. Those are the ones that we did, uh, included in the study. And uh, here are some examples of the verbs that we uh, collected. Um, we have, there are two verbs that um, are focused on the surface, on the ground where the uh, figures are located, right? And this is tui je, which is beyond, quite generic at this point. And then aja je, which is more like be in. And then uh, postural verbs uh, that um, are used to talk about the postures of, for instance, animate beings, in particular human beings and also animals. And then they are extended to be used with inanimate beings. They, they use from uh, locating um, human beings uh, uh, is extended. Basically figures are being seen, presented, construed as if they were human beings. So you have standing, sitting, lying, and hanging. Um, there's usually a question about why is hanging so uh, important and it's associated with human beings? Well, in, in, the, in the Amazon, this is quite common to have hanging as one of the basic verbs. And the idea is that maybe it's important because in most of these cultures, you have hammocks, hammocks and hanging hammocks in a particular way. Hanging is um, quite common and kind of a basic position as well. And then we collect all these dispositional verbs that pay attention to the figure and its re relationship with the, with the ground. You have floating, boats and canoes, and uh, leaning, attached, hooked, stuck, introduced, and so on and so forth, okay? So here I have some of the examples uh, that this is more uh, towards the linguists <laughs> uh, that like, uh, usually like to see details. So here are examples with the topological verbs. You have the stick is on the table in which you just need the uh, be on, right? The, the verb, um, the topological verb. The rope is in the basket, right? In being. In, and being, in this case, being can be predicted to some extent based on the ground itself. It's usually associated with containers. With beyond, that's not possible. You can have all kinds of grounds, okay? Not necessarily a, a flat or something. There are a couple of examples with uh, postural verbs. I already showed you with the example with the bottle and with the ball, and this is what uh, this is referring to, right? You can use these types of verbs, uh, postural verbs as well. There's another type of construction that involves an existential verb, pai, right? And this is uh, used to talk about the location of figures, but starting from the ground. 
from the perspective of the ground, right? So in this case, uh, uh, for instance, if you want to talk about the bottle is on the table, you could also start with the ground. On the table is the bottle. This is what's going on with this particular uh, verb. It's used to uh, highlight the ground, start from the perspective on the ground and, and we locate the figure. And finally, the copula construction, which is a, a specific way of uh, talking about very complex situations. This is where uh, usually the, the option that it's employed when they want to talk about, uh, for instance, those pragmatically odd situations or more complex relationships in which they pay attention to all these details to locate the figure, right? And uh, that is what the copula is used for. So because of we saw this uh, complex pattern, these different types of options, in collaboration with uh, Hunter Brown uh, from the Department of Linguistics, we started a project uh, to try to answer these questions, right? Can a single language have multiple preferred conceptualization types? from which speakers can draw to prefer, uh, profile different aspects of location. Because the idea is that uh, a language, a community, will have one preferred pattern, one basic default preferred pattern, and also several other possibilities. But how do we find out? How do we uncover which one? If a language has these like four types of uh, uh, talking about location, which one is preferred? How can we get to that? That was one of the, the questions that we had, right? And also the other question that we had was, if uh, we see these different ways of uh, different possibilities in Sequoia, how would this uh, system fit within the, the typology that said that the, there are three types of language? Remember that I mentioned at the beginning? Type one, type two, type three, depending on the number of verbs that they can be used as basic. How would that, uh, how would uh, uh, Sequoia fit there? And uh, uh, so here are some results. I'm going to share only a few results, right? So when we look at the patterns among the uh, 470 responses, we see that one of the topological verbs beyond the one that talk about the, the surface, the item being in a, in a surface, 45% uh, uh, of the responses um, pattern in that way. It was used for in 45% of the responses. Beyond was used in 45% of the responses. And postural verbs were used in 36% of the responses. So basically the topological verb and the postural verb are both quite common. So quite widely used. And of course when we look at we see in the postural category we have also symmetrical strips. And uh, though we have to consider that uh, this reflects what uh, the, the scenes or the types of relationships that are portrayed in the pictures. That does, this doesn't represent the overall distribution in, in communication in everyday language, right? It's about only the scenes portrayed in the picture. So this could be very well the result of the, the pictures that we use. And then you have the other ones that have a smaller distribution of modes. The other thing that we uh, uh, found is that speakers use different possibilities. It's, uh, the responses uh, vary quite a bit among um, speakers. And so we did uh, different types of calculations and uh, to uh, find out what would be the uh, patterns of similarities or differences across speakers. And for instance, um, here uh, we gave uh, these scores depending of if one particular uh, stimuli was used by six speakers in with the same, same response. So here, this 14 means that there were 14 pictures out of the 86 pictures that were, uh, uh, that elicited the similar response from all the speakers. Okay, only 14, only 14 out of the 88 have similar responses, right? And what was the response? It was beyond, right? And there were 12 pictures that were used by five, uh, in which five speakers used the same response, and it was beyond. So beyond is the one that it's used more systematically, uh, at least across speakers, um, for more items, for more pictures. Being is less, there's no picture 
that elicited the uh, similar response across speakers with be. Okay. And among the postural verbs, the one that it's used more systematically is lying. You see that uh, for six stimuli, six pictures, we have the similar response across speakers with lie and so on and so forth. So the one that it's used in more unique ways is the copula. You see here, 25, in 25 instances, we, for 25 pictures, we have single responses, meaning only one speaker construed that scene in that particular way. So that's what the, uh, kind of the evidence that we're using to see that the copula is the one that allows speakers to pay attention to different uh, details and build it, the, talk about this uh, scene in very different ways. So when we look at the distribution, the use of the verbs according to the figures to see if we can uh, predict whether a particular verb will be used depending on a particular type of figure, we see that this is not possible because Look here, for BE, you have all kinds of figures can be talked about with BE. The same with BEYOND. BEYOND is extremely common. That is true. But also with BEYOND, you can use all kinds of figures. So the, you cannot predict for, uh, by the figure which verb will be used. That's the point here, this figure. When you look at in, uh, by grounds, verbs by grounds, we see a kind of a similar situation. Again, you can use all these verbs for different types of grounds, whether this is table, floor, um, what do we have, a rock, and uh, trees, and um, tree stump, all of that. The only one that it's closer to, uh, the close to be predicted by ground is being, as I said before, these ones that go with containment. Here you have only the basket and canyon. So containers is what uh, uh, help us predict the uh, being verb. But for the others, no, we don't have it. And then you have here the uh, relation. Same thing, there's no way to predict that uh, particular verbs will, will be used with specific relations. All the verbs are good to uh, uh, talk about different types of relations between figures and grounds, okay? And uh, um, so this is a little bit of our, our um, what we conclude that yes, in fact, we have different types of constructions, at least four topological verbs, postural verbs, copular verb constructions, and inverse locational. And each of them profile different pieces, different aspects of locative scenes. Each of them pay attention to different aspects. So, what uh, and the other thing that we saw is that um, this way of talking about space it's not necessarily unique to Sequoia or Kokama for that respect. But we see, for instance, these all these languages and belong that belong to different families like Sequani, Wahobian, uh, Troma is an isolate, Yuphup is Maku, and this all is uh, Sakana, different linguistic families in the Amazon that have a large number of. Uh, verbs and verb types that predicate location, that are used to predicate location. So this situation is not necessarily unique. The, the fact that the uh, speakers can have pro different uh, uh, ways of uh, talking about space and have a different, perhaps, preferred ways, all these um, available patterns, depending on what they want to talk about. Okay, so the conclusions of the, the study that we um, just did is, the, of this uh, presentation in any case, is that Kama does not have a uh, verbs do not have uh, verbs dedicated to express location, contrary to Sequoia that has many. But the Kokama speakers have several other strategies to describe locative scenes, including relational nouns and postpositions. Sequoia uh, in contra display four unique construction types to provide different uh, aspects of locative scenes. And we believe that there's little reason to imagine that Sequoia is unique in having multiple preferred locative construction types. And uh, I conclude by thanking all the speakers that I've been, I have um, the opportunity to interview and work with over the years. These are 36 uh, speakers of Sequoia and uh, 42 speakers of Kokama. All of them are very, very thankful. And of course, you know, those that have contributed to uh, my work over the years uh, here at UNM. Thank you. That was fantastic. So um, 
right now, uh, you know, we have some time for, for questions. Does anyone uh, have a question following up on this uh, fantastic talk? There's something that, um, that I was very interested in, which was the use of these of the postural verbs for inanimate objects and, and animals. And is there, I mean, is there uh, any kind of patterning though that, that, that are, are, is, are they always used for in all inanimate objects or are there's like some verbs that you would only use for humans, but some you would use uh, sometimes for inanimate objects and in other contexts you would use other verbs for inanimate objects. Like are there certain inanimate objects that are seen as more human-like than others? Oh, I see. Yeah. Whether we could entertain the idea of uh, that we are seeing uh, inanimate things with some animate features? Yeah. Or animals being more human-like. This is the anthropologist in me asking, <laughs> asking that question. Well, I have to confess that I haven't seen any hints in that direction. So it, it, it's more like extending those verbs that we call in linguistics more uh, grammaticalization processes in which uh, verbs that were uh, basically usually combine better, um, co occur better with uh, animal beings, then can be extended further. And um, this is not uncommon in, in the Amazon. And it, what it's more cool is that it's, there are usually three verbs that have uh, been documented across you know, uh, languages in the world, which is uh, standing, sitting, and lying. Those three happens, you know, you'll find it across the globe, which is very cool to see why those three, right? And in the Amazon is added the fourth, the hanging. And again, it's not any hanging, right? We don't want to suggest here that hanging is so associated with the human beings in the Amazon. It is more about the location of the hanging. And in some um, uh, uh, communities, you even have different type of um, hanging amongst or, or hanging items, more horizontally, more in, in some curve or more vertical, um, vertically, yeah. And specific verbs, depending on the uh, relationship in the vertical axis. So uh, I haven't, to, to answer your question, I haven't noticed necessarily inanimate entities being perceived or presented as animals. What we do, though, is very common as in, in societies, is that um, uh, animals being uh, portrayed with anthropomorphic features. This is quite common. This is quite common. It's present. And so animals speak all the time in the text and speak with human beings, but, you know, each other, and, but not with them. That's my, my take at this point. Maybe I'll change my mind later when I study more. What are your plans, Rosa, for... Um you know, for continuing this study? Well, the short term is to try to go back to study now more dynamic uh, location, more movement, now going further, right? So far it's been everything about static location, but I'd like to study dynamic location. And of course, continue to work with them in other in more, um, education related projects, okay. teaching. Yeah, that's yeah. super. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we just had some uh, uh, workshop with teachers, uh, even uh, you know, via Zoom, uh, because there's uh, difficulties in, in, in this case, for instance, for the Sequoia teachers to be able to get a contract with the government, none of them have, a, well, maybe one, they have a, a training in pedagogy or you know a certificate a teaching certificate so um if they don't have that the government cannot hire them to teach right. that's by law right they have to show some type of training and oh, the one way of doing this is we try to have workshops uh, in their project there in place and they come to the city and we, we participate in work with the, you know, uh, work with the different aspects in L1 methodologies, L2 methodologies, math, and I do more the language, the language part. If they don't have get the certification, they won't have a contract, and the government will hire a, a 
teachers from other regions, from other parts of the country that don't even speak Sequoia, and that's a problem for kids. So this year was a challenge. How we're gonna do that because of the pandemic? And we did manage to have some workshops and I hope they, they're hired. They're in that process now. Great. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Joshua. Hi. Uh, hi, Rosa. Uh, really nice. Uh, first, I wanted to uh, applaud you for making your own pictures. I know there's a lot of kind of uh, posture st uh, stimuli out there. And through my experience, sometimes they don't really relate cross-culturally. So that was really nice and really beautiful pictures. Uh, I know you've worked some on Amazonian Spanish as well. And I was curious, uh, does the use of posture verbs, uh, tr uh, does it get adopted in kind of L2 Sequoia Spanish? Uh, do you see that? I noticed that when I was in Holland, you know, someone said, oh, uh, my car is standing on the corner. And I thought about that for a second, you know, in uh, L2 English and Dutch. And knowing that you work in Spanish, do you see that uh, the, you, over, I guess you could call it overuse of posture verbs uh, in L2 Spanish of uh, Sequoia people? Okay, let me, uh, let's see how do I address. I do have a data from uh, Spanish, Seco uh, Sequoia speakers, Spanish uh, from Sequoia. <laughs> But first, they haven't analyzed much. But they, in general, they, Spanish is quite limited. It's not like they are very fluent in, in Spanish. So I don't think uh, that's one thing. There are only a few of them that speak some Spanish. The majority is still monolingual in Sequoia. And there's why it's very important to use stimuli as well. And, but what I've noticed is a lot of postural verbs in uh, Kokama speakers, which you would say, how are we gonna explain if Kokama don't have postural verbs, right? Well, uh, uh, you saw that there are some use of, of postural verbs in Kokama, but it's not like it's very common. At the, that would be more difficult to argue that this is used as preferred construction in, to talk about location. But they do use it in Kokam as well. And, but in Amazonian Spanish, it's quite common, but, but it's, I think it's more like a, a larger pattern. So I don't know how can we tie this back to a particular as influence of a particular language that has posture. So the natural expectations would be, the expectation would be that the, the Spanish of the sequoias will be full of overuse of posture, right? That's a, a nice uh, uh, hypothesis to, you know, to, Try to study, and I will, but I haven't done it yet. But I did, I have uh, noticed this uh, in the Kokamas, which always uh, struck me as strange since if they don't have postural verbs quite, you know, grammaticalized as the other ones. Yeah, but that's something to, to, to study, right? That would be cool. Do we have any other questions? Well, if not, please join me then in thanking uh, Dr. Vallejos for her wonderful talk today. So we'll give her, give her the Zoom round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much. No problem.